Good morning, everybody. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Martin Guest from the University in, in Cardiff. Martin and I, we are going back quite some time now. Too long. So I'm not going into the details no. <laughs> because um, you're not here to see me. You can see me on Zoom and whatever. You're here to see Martin, and Martin is giving a very interesting talk which is actually similar, very similar to the one in CIUK, which he couldn't do this year. And he's talking about performance of community codes in multi-core processors. Martin. Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invite. I was a bit surprised to get the invite because I didn't think genuinely that you'd be interested in this stuff. Um, hopefully within the next hour at least, you won't all be falling asleep. I shall be checking at regular intervals for the sleds coming up from the audience. Um, right, so what are we going to try and do? Um, as Jorgas pointed out, typically these presentations, and I've been doing them for a long time, are presented at Computing Insight UK. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I actually kicked off the original machine evaluation workshop, which was the predecessor of the CI UK, and that was, I'm just trying to remember this on the way out, but the very late 80s. So this, these things have been going on a long time, and one has witnessed uh, a really a tremendous change, I suppose, without saying, in the landscape that one, one has reported on. In some ways, it's a bit sad because one has seen a huge variation in suppliers and processors. Now everything aligning to a simple choice between AMD, possibly ARM and Intel. And in some ways that, that's a wee bit depressing, but I can't waffle like this because if I do, my reputation of always overrunning with a hundred slides is gonna be even more pronounced. So I need to crack on. So what are we gonna be trying to do? And it should have been really straightforward. If I've been given the CI UK talk now, then, Something has happened in the interim, namely access to Sapphire Rapids. And that has kind of changed things pretty substantially. So that's the kind of good news. It wasn't good news for me because it meant I had to change every damn slide. But actually, it's probably quite interesting, more interesting than it would have been if one was just talking about Isolate. But what I don't have is access to Genoa. So a fair comparison, it's not fair to compare Sapphire Rapids to Milan because they are completely different in terms of capabilities. But anyway, so what we're going to be doing is focusing on systems featuring predominantly processors from both Intel and AMD. So Sapphire Rapids and Isolate be the leading SKUs from Intel and basic, unfortunately, not Genoa from AMD. Um, baseline clusters will be couple of the older Skylake and AMD Epic Rome nodes. There are two Intel Sapphire Rapid clusters. Now, the high bandwidth memory one actually is really disappointing. I should say that up front. Um, does brilliantly on stream, as you would expect. So it's actually a terabyte on stream. But in all the other applications I'm looking at here, it had very little impact at all. So that was a wee bit sad. So two Intel Sapphire Rapids and then five isolate clusters. And I won't go into the details. One was interested in the variations, box B, number of cores, but actually they kind of vanish in the noise when you actually bring Sapphire Rapids into play. Um, and then four AMD um, Epic Milan clusters. We look at seven applications in total. Um, and hence 100 slides and hence the impossibility of getting through that lot. So the organizers have kindly agreed that they will wave a certain number of fingers at me with 10 minutes to go because I'll need 10 minutes to actually conclude. So we'll be looking at molecular simulation, so DL poly and amber, materials modeling, CASTEP and VAS, electronic structure code, Games UK, and then two ocean modeling codes, NEMO and FDCOM. And the important thing really um, to bear in mind is when you look at scalability and when you, when you analyze performance, how are you doing it? Do you do it by cores or do you do it by nodes? 
So they're very different things, actually, as we will see. And one of the major impacts of the very large um, number of cores per node, so 112 in the case of Sapphire Rapids, is a very different picture when you look at processing element scalability and you look at process scalability by the number of nodes. But we'll see that. The one thing I'm not doing is pricing. I've been guillotined almost numerous times by suppliers when I try to mention price. And actually, price is meaningless because list price is, is a joke, as we know. And what you get to pay in practice depends on how, um, how the supplier wishes to engage with you. And I think it's as simple as that. So pricing is a bit, a bit irrelevant. OK, so methodology and approach, quick summary here. So no special treatment, right? The, the codes are run as a standard user. There's no dedicated access involved. They've been run in production mode. So it's what you would see as a user is of interest. And one is not looking really at, well, the focus is on mid-range clusters. So the highest number of core count using these applications is a thousand cores. <clears throat> so we're not talking about real scalability. We're not talking about weak scaling, actually. We're just focusing on the typical jobs that would run on um, the production cluster. <clears throat> Point four is a lot of waffle, actually, but it's actually quite important waffle. And the last two machine evaluation workshops, sorry, CIUK sessions, I've wasted far too many hours mucking around trying to sort this out. So this is running Intel Parallel Studio, actually on AMD hardware. And what one routinely finds is huge problems in terms of stability. You move from one version of Parallel Studio, so 2019-5 to 2019-12, Things fail, things fall over, no rhyme, no bloody reason. And it is exceptionally improved, exceptionally frustrating. Intel 1 API sorted a lot of that out, but you still see it in practice. Um, so the, the final bullet there, that when you move with Vast and Castnet between Intel 2018 and Intel 2020 on AMD hardware, you run into all sorts of problems. I mean, the performance goes down the toilet. Right, so running Intel software on AMD hardware is a, well, it's a not great. And it's certainly not, I mean, if you look at Archer 2, they do not do that. And there's a very good reason for not doing it. Okay, so very quick run through both the Genoa line um, from AMD and also the uh, Sapphire Rapid one from Intel. This gives you a picture and it's a real shame I haven't got a pointer and the real pointer ain't gonna work. So four columns, this is looking at various generations of AMD processors from Naples through Rome, from Milan up to Genoa. And you'll notice um, clearly AMD got pretty carried away with how good Genoa was because they changed the name they mean from the Lenchen. They went from the 7,000 up to the 9,000. <coughs> So I wonder how much marketing cash that involved. But anyway, but it is an exceptionally good chip. There's no doubt about that. You've got up to 96 cores. So 192 cores on a dual processor node, typical currency for HPC. Dozen DDR5 memory controllers, max of eight, six terabytes of memory and 128 lanes of PCI. So pretty impressive. Um, I did try here to actually go through, I guess most of you will be fully aware of that stuff. You won't be fully aware of all of those though. So wind back Martin, apologies for that. So this is just trying to take you through from the epic Rome. So Naples was kind of a bit of a warm up, right? But I, the Rome with its nine chiplets and its central 14 nanometer IO die was actually a real, really positive step in the right direction. A um, couple of the processors involved in, in, the, in the review here, 7742 and 7502, 
um, are, will act as part of our baseline systems. Pretty significant improvement going from Zen 2, um, i.e. <coughs> AMD Rome to Milan, so Zen 3. And then some really neat stuff here when using stack L3 cache. So basically providing a total of 768 meg of L3 cache on the so-called X series of Milan. And again, we have some numbers in this presentation which show that. <clears throat> and of course, what the fundamental driver in all of this is the instructions per clock. And Genoa actually had a 14% height, which is almost identical to the 15% height actually on Intel, on Intel Sapphire Rapids. And that is actually looking at the, um, the IPC, the instructions for clock improvement here for Intel. So we've got two things we're trying to show here. The IPC improvement on the left as a function of processor family along the horizontal axis. And then the cumulative IPC change um, actually, which is on the right and is captured by the black bar. Um, so actually, Sapphire Rapids, although I personally, I, I don't think it, it, it is as good as Genoa, nevertheless, it's pretty significant improvement compared to Ice Lake. There's a few Ice Lake facts and figures. Um, I don't think we need to spend any time looking at that, except it went up to 40, 40 cores. Um, and the 8380 is actually part of this current presentation. Right. So let's move from a summary of the, of, the, of the capabilities of those processes into real facts and figures and real performance baseline systems. Skylake Gold 6148 and also the AMD Roam, um, both of which feature in the cluster at Cardiff. I've tried to capture on the next four or five slides each of the processes involved. So a couple of Cascade Lake processors, 6248, 8280, a whole slew of Ice Lake clusters, which actually the previous um, CIUK presentation would have focused really on these. So these vary by interconnect. So we're looking at Mellanox HDR on the one hand, and we're also looking at Cornelis networks, so the OPE fabric, an alternative to Mellanox. Um, there are some conclusions that I would draw on that. So not only are we looking actually at different capabilities of those isolate nodes, we're also looking at the interconnect, whether it be HP, um, sorry, HDR, or whether it be OPE. The, these are the two Sapphire Rapids clusters, so the H480. Two gigahertz um, baseline clock, as I said, two gig, 105 meg of L3 cache and DDR5 memory. So actually significantly better credentials than the Ice Lake system. And then the Platinum 9480, which is this high bandwidth memory. And other than stream, um, I, I personally, I didn't see much improvement at all. And then the Milan clusters, we we'll touch on these as we come across them. But the most interesting one probably is the 7573X because that's, this has this extended L3 cache. Um, and that really does make quite a difference on some applications. So here are the applications we're looking at. The El Poly and Amber, VASP and Castet, Games UK and FB Common Nemo. And that mixture, probably enables us to try to hit that bottom line target in the last bullet, namely the check memory bandwidth and latency, no floating point performance, interconnect performance, particularly across those two classes of interconnect, <clears throat> both in terms of latency and bandwidth and sustained IO performance. The IO performance will come from NEMO um, and the particular data set which is being used. I uh, should mention this, this is actually an incredibly useful tool and I've always found it really useful. So from a linear who were taken over by ARM, who were taken over by Lenaro, so their history is a wee bit uh, has changed, but this tool still is pretty important. It gives you a really easy picture of application performance at quite a high level. So if you're looking at any parallel code, I strongly advise trying to use this because it really is pretty helpful. Uh, these are the sort of 
pictures that you can very easily construct with access to the tool. So on the bottom right, you're looking at the CPU time breakdown, and I'm going to have to grab that pointer, move towards the screen. So we're looking here at scalar, a vector, and memory access. What you don't want to see is what you're seeing here, actually. What you don't want to see is dominated by memory access, hardly any vector instructions, and a load of scalar. Right. That's a really bad makeup. And too many of the applications in here look like that. So, what you, as all processor types, and actually the ability, I think, to actually capitalize on GPUs, rely on being able to exploit the, the sort of vector numeric operations as they're tagged here. If you can't do that, then a lot of the capabilities in the, in the current and future generation of processors, you're not going to be able to capitalize on. On the left, you're looking at the breakdown as you increase the core count. And when I use PE processing elements, I actually mean cores because all of the applications in here are a single MPI process per core. So when I'm talking about MPI processes, I'm not using hybrid code. I'm just running straight MPI. So that's not good, and that isn't good. What you want to would hope that you would see would be the ability for MPI to kick in a lot later than it is actually kicking in there. But these pictures, I think, are quite valuable in the sense that they give you a pretty good picture, easily obtained. Uh, you don't have to change the code. You don't have to recompile the code. You just basically run with module in place, just run that um, right off the bat. A bunch of pointers here about um, compiler and runtime options. I mentioned this issue running code um, on AMD processors using Intel MKL. Um, so basically, you have to do things like this um, because this was the version, the last version of Intel MKL, which recognized AVX2 on non Intel processors. So if you don't do that, then you're not capable of actually exploiting AVX instructions uh, using the Intel software. And I'm going to get very confused here between what pointers work and anyway, cracking on. So this is the screen benchmark results. Um, and they kind of look at, I guess, what you might expect. So on the left, we have processor generations here. Left is focused on Intel, right is focused on AMD. Um, and as you move through from our baseline system, the Skylake Gold to Cascade Lake, Ice Lake, and Sapphire Rapids, um, you see half a terabyte of performance here from the stream on Sapphire Rapids. And in fact, you see exactly the same on Milan, right? So these are on very high core count, relatively speaking, nodes. So no difference here in these isolate variations, probably not surprising. But that actually doesn't tell you much about what you're going to see in practice when you run a typical MPI code. Because what you're interested in when you do that is really the, the effective bandwidth that each of those MPI processors experience. And if you're running 128 cores with 128 processors, you've got to divide these numbers by 128. Right? So what you will actually see in practice, and when you do that, things change quite dramatically. So if you go back to our Skylake system, 4.8 gig, it doesn't improve, right? It just does not improve. You come over here to the 7573X from Milan and you have the, 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 the cache, the additional cache, and things are looking a lot better. These numbers are dreadful. So these are on the 128 core 7713 and the 7763. I mean, that, you could, well, it's just poor put it rather mildly, because after five years, right, you've gone down by effectively 25% in terms of effective memory bandwidth. So that's not good. 
Okay, so we have to put it on this in a minute. Bring that down, picking that up. So that's the first of the synthetics. The second is really MPI performance. So this is looking at ping pong um, between two cores on separate nodes. And this is a lot more sane and sensible than it used to be. Um, in the days of gigabit, comparing gigabit with InfiniBand, you would literally get factors of 100 difference here in latency. And many codes are, are latency driven. So it's only a factor of two there. There's some willy wobbly stuff down here in the Cornelis network systems that if you're, the code you were running were dependent on this sort of message length and you were dominated by point to point communications will give you a bit of concern. But that is probably not the real driver behind these benchmarks. I mean, the real driver is actually on the collective operations. So, for example, the materials codes often involve you in collectives. So you're exchanging data from real to Fourier uh, space. So this sort of thing is nasty. Um, different picture. So you're basically the lower the total time it takes to do that collective, um, the better. So you've got quite a variation here, but the biggest problem is here because if you look at the typical message lengths involved in many material codes, they're of this order. And you've got a large variation here, right? So does it matter? Well, if, if the end application code, in this case, Tester, spends a lot of its time doing MPI all to all V, which it does, then this is a problem and you better get your processor right. And you'll notice more to the point that this blue here is, boom, Sapphire Rapids, okay? And what we will see is actually fast forwarding, a very fast forwarding, that if we actually go through all the codes, then Sapphire Rapids does a really good job, relatively speaking, except for Casto, except for this. And I think that's the reason why, actually. And I don't know, I have to say why it is as poor as it is, but it is not great. Okay, so, and I mentioned this core to core and node to node. Um, so this is quite important. Core to core, really the performance of the jobs is a fixed number of cores. So you take 128 cores or 256 or 512 and you run that. Um, and look at scalability across different processes and different MPIs, or, or a node to node comparison. And the node to node comparison, thank you, node to node um, is actually far more representative of what you will see in practice. And it's more reflective um, of a true workload. Okay, so the first example um, is Geo Poly. And what probably bearing in mind the amount of time I've got left. Uh, I'll do three of these seven applications and then we'll fast forward to the conclusions because actually the conclusions from the first three are effectively mirrored through the rest, but we'll summarize the rest at the end. So DL Poly, um, CCP5 Collaborative Computational Fire Project 5, Molecular Dynamics Code written by Bill Smith, Tim Forrester and Ian, eh, sorry, Ilian Todorov. And like most vintage, let's call them vintage, um, parallel codes. So they started life really as replicated data codes. And the problem with replicated data is you're constrained by the size because every node has to have a copy of the entire data structures. Um, by the time you move to domain decomposition and you've distributed the data, you can handle much larger cases. DL Poly, its strength is in this huge variation of, in terms of application areas. So some of the, many of the other parallel MD codes, so Amber up the top there, Charm, NAND, LAMPS, Gromax, actually not so much LAMPS, but most of those others feature on biomolecular simulations, whereas DL Poly actually has a much broader coverage. Uh, so I've waffled on there pretty much about domain decomposition. Um, Coulombic energy remains global and 
through co-developed, I think by Ian Bush, the Spoos particle mesh AWOLD, um, you handle the Coulombic forces. Couple of examples, sodium chloride gramicidin, just looking at the gramicidin. So there's numerous slides like this, actually all the way through. Um, so no surprises, but I should at least actually say on the first one, the key things to watch out for and the structure behind this. So we have performance, always use performance, not time. And go into the reasons why. Up here, we're normalizing typically with respect to this um, Skylake system here. Uh, the pinks you'll find will typically be the Ice Lake systems. The Cambridge blue, not deliberate, is actually the Sapphire Rapids system. Um, so when we move looking at scalability by processes, then you'll actually see that at this point, Sapphire Rapids is outperforming the other uh, ice lake nodes in particular. Um, we've still got a couple of A and D things being shown on here. So, um, and by the time you get up to here, then actually, the Skylake 8358, which tends to be the most performant of the Ice Lake systems, is actually winning. If you move, and I'm hoping it's on the next slide, when you move to node to node, boom, the picture changes, right? So here, on two nodes, four nodes, eight nodes, you actually see that the Sapphire Rapid system is the dominant system, the most performant system. And that's not really very surprising. Why does it kind of tail off here? Well, again, if you think about it, it's not that surprising. So eight nodes corresponds to 800, well, 896 cores. And you're starting for that particular test case to run out of parallelism on a thousand cores. Okay, whereas these other ones are working down still at the several hundred cores. And therefore, this lead that you're seeing here tends to be eroded, but it still is a significant lead. Okay, uh, we can move on to AMBER, the second of the molecular dynamics codes. Pretty similar story, I think it's fair to say. Um, so this is a biomolecular simulation code. It's pretty popular. There are four different benchmarks moving from small through to the M45 case. Um, Benchmarks comprise major urinary proteins and IBM ligands, uh, strange name, but IBM ligands. And you're talking about a million atom simulation there while, when you're on the M45 case. Two versions of the code, AMBER 18, not surprisingly from 2018, and AMBER 22, again from 20, uh, 2022. Um, and there's a claim here that actually um, AMBER 22 provides better performance on multiple CPUs. That claim is manifestly not true, actually. And as a proof of the pudding, this is again, this is looking at nodes. So nodes again, complete domination by Sapphire Rapids, 112 cores on a node. Theoretically, if the per core performance was the same, as Skylake, which it isn't, it is better, then you would expect that factor to be 2.8, right? Because you've got 40 Skylake cores on a node, you've got 112 Sapphire Rapids. So on a single node, if you were looking at a single node performance, the factor should be 2.8. If it's more than 2.8, that means that the core performance on Sapphire Rapids is better. If it's less than 2.8, there's probably an issue. But anyway, so that's actually the performance that you see on using AMBER 18. That's the performance you see using AMBER 22. And it's identical, actually. Identical within spitting distance. So there is the um, performance report. And again, this ain't great, right? You're dominated by memory, you're mainly scalar, you've got no vector instructions here. But actually, this thing will scale a lot further, as you can see, because even at 320 cores, um, it's still being dominated by CPU performance. 
Um, so these are the scalability in terms of NPI processes, number of cores. So again, at small core count, one is actually seeing that the Sapphire Rapids is leading. That again gets eroded over time. The yellow bars are quite interesting, actually, because the two systems outside, the two purple systems that are cushioning those two, they're the HDR ones. The circled and the yellow circled are the OPA, so the Omnipath Express Interconnect. And it's quite clear as the number of processes are increasing, the, these systems are falling behind. Okay. So I think in terms of availability, OPA is an attractive option. In terms of scalability, maybe in some cases less so. Um, M4, M45 performance, you see exactly the same thing again with Amber 18. Um, and on the M27 test phase, again, the similar sort of conclusion. So I've not really put any results in here about GPUs, right? Um, so here's one slide which does. And it may argue strongly against the whole rest of the presentation, but hell, there you go. Um, so let, let me try and summarize. The most important thing from this slide and the next slide is software is far more important than hardware, right? Um, that is an obvious when you look at that slide. So let me try and explain. This is actually showing scalability of the Skylake. So there's the Skylake nodes, again, normalizing with respect to one node. This is a single node with GPU capabilities, the P100, the V100. Just focusing on those, then you can see on a single GPU node using Amber, then you're actually exceeding the performance of up to nine. Um, Skylake nodes. And if you do the same thing with Sapphire Rapids, boom. So the blues go up. Well, that's Sapphire Rapids. And eight of these nodes is actually outperforming the dual processor node just. But the big purple mother on the end is Amber 22. So Amber 22, I was slagging off before, basically saying there is no CPU performance gain is because I think all of the effort from the co-developers have been invested in the GPU implementation. And as you, you can see, that is, so it's this you compare with that, that's over 22, that's over 18, same test space, and the performance has gone up by effectively a factor of three because you've got mixed mode arithmetic, you've got all sorts of things in the Amber 22 case that are not there in the Amber 18. Okay, so how am I doing on time, Mr. Chair? Okay, well, I'll do VASP and then we'll fast forward to the conclusions and I'll finish on time. But as a hand up, don't put your hand up. <laughs> no, no, please. A single GPU. The bad news is, and I wasn't going to mention this, when I try and run with two, performance goes down the toilet. So literally, those numbers I literally got within the last 48 hours, actually. So, but I'm sure the single node number is correct. The single GPU number is correct. And there's clearly, I'm actually generating the code was dreadful, right? You've got multiple versions of different software. Some work, some don't. You've got GNU, MPI, you, you have Puda. And most versions of CUDA, it just bellies up and doesn't run. So it's a bit of a bit of a nightmare. And these all none of this stuff reflects that. I moaned earlier on about Milan and Intel compilers. Well, so that's chicken feed compared to trying to get that to work. Anyway, that's so um, all of these codes are quite similar. Actually, the degree of optimization in them, I think, has varies quite markedly. They're all DFT calculations, so density functional theory. They're all pseudo potentials because if you don't use those, then you're in big trouble because you can't handle the core electrons. And most of them are based on plane waves. Okay, so there's not a huge amount of difference. Um, 
Some are a lot more popular than others, maybe because of history and because some are open source and some are commercial, but basically they all come out of the same building block. So this is the Vienna Ab initio simulation package, VAS. It's the most, on Cardiff, it's the most popular package by a mile. Um, and on Archer, when they used to, when they used to rank their systems, it was voted number one repeatedly. Well, not voted, but it was ranked number one. They stopped doing that for um, a variety of different reasons. They don't rank them anymore. So we're looking, and there are different modes of parallelism involved in these codes. So this is looking at two different benchmark cases, palladium oxide and a zeolite calculation. The difference in them really is the zeolite calculation is bigger, but more to the point is the palladium oxide as 10k points, so can involve and invoke k-point parallelism, whereas the zeolite only has two. If you look at your performance report, then you'll see this diet plot on the bottom here, on the, on the bottom right, has a much better usage of vector instructions. So the two simulation codes that we looked at were NAF, in the sense that they were hovering around the 5% exploitation of those vector instructions, this, this looks a lot healthier. And in fact, if we look at CASTEP, then exactly the same thing holds. CASTEP's got that MPI all to all V problem. And maybe I was being a bit over ambitious and I was gonna finish on time because I need to say something about that CASTEP stuff. Um, but anyway, he said, giving his first excuse. Um, let's just whip through these quickly. So again, this is looking at the just scalability by the number of cores, by the number of MPI processes, we're fixing it at that. And as you can see, by the time you get up to 256 cores, right, it's as flat as a pancake. There's our baseline system, and there are Ice Lake and Sapphire Rapids, and effectively almost identical in performance on the core to core analysis. Uh, there's our point here about dodgy use of Intel compilers on AMD hardware. So combination of compiler with MKL with MPI libraries means that as you increase and, and in theory move to later versions from Intel 18 to 19 to 20, performance goes down, right? which is not good news. It should be going the other way around. It does it at every node count. It's fair to say that decline in performance. And when you consider all of the Intel SKUs on here, you'll see things are just really flat. By the time you get out of 256 cores, then the Milan 7573X is performing in a very similar fashion to both Sapphire Rapids and Ice Lake. When you move to node to node, boom, then again, total domination by Sapphire Rapids, um, but not, not a really a fair test because well, I only had access to six nodes, so I can't do that eight node number for the 7573X. Uh, we skip over the zeolite thing because it doesn't really add a lot to it. Cast it. So let's just have a quick look at this because this is, I think, the ramifications of MPI all to all be. And it's pretty dodgy when this is being recorded saying things like that, because it can come back to haunt. It's a bit like making vague assumptions about pricing and saying that. And the next day, the bailiffs are knocking on the door um, from Intel asking you why you said this, that, or the other. So one needs to be a wee bit careful, but I'm pretty sure this is right. There is our... This is actually for the AL3X3 simulation. So it's the 270 atom sapphire uh, surface. Um, again, really good usage of CPU vector instructions. So that, that's pretty good. Um, memory the memory um, is still an issue and scalability over there on the right um, is actually giving you a picture which actually says the moment you move beyond 160 processing elements, and MPI is starting to take over. This is the story, which is not great, about when you're trying to use Intel compilers, MPI, MKL, 
on AMD hardware. And if you look at the use of Intel 20 on the 7502, that's bad news. I mean, it's just flatlining um, compared to the performance that you see on other Intel clusters and actually even on the AMD ROM. So why that happens, but it does happen. So here's our looking at the performance, um, gain, MPI processors. Probably the bottom line on this issue with is captured on this slide and I think on the next slide. So remember I said node to node is great, right? On Sapphire Rapids, you, you win every time. <clears throat> Not true here. So look at what's happening out on four nodes. Right, the performance has declined quite dramatically, and it's not a scalability issue, that's for sure. And I think when you move to uh, that's I haven't got the eight uh, number on there, but that is still, I believe, the change that that pattern of behavior is a reflection on the issues around or, or draw or V um, on, on the Sapphire Rapids. Okay, I have 10 minutes left. Go on, Mr. Chair. A little bit more. Now you're talking. Oh, all right. Okay, we'll leave this out. We'll leave Benji K out. And we'll also leave out Nemo. And we'll also leave out SVCon. Right, so this is actually, how do you put all these numbers together? What's the best way of doing it? What conclusions can you draw from it? So the easy way actually, is just to compare system for system um, in this type of graph where what we're looking at is the code up on the vertical axis and we're looking at the performance and we're comparing Sapphire Rapids. So this is core to core, okay? 128 processing elements and you'll see Variations between 1.2 times faster and 1.75 times faster, an average factor of 1.4. You can do the same thing with isolate, and there the average improvement factor I think is about 1.3. So, in terms of just in terms of cores, performance of a core, that is the sort of improvement you're looking at. The other way of looking at it is actually using a Kivir diagram, as we're actually doing here. So here, each of the spokes correspond to a particular application and a particular data set. And what we do is the optimum performance that we're seeing across all of those systems for that case is normalized to one. And then the others are rated pro rata compared to that one. So remember here, we're looking at core performance we said that there's not a huge amount of difference, and sure enough, that's what we're seeing. So the innermost circle, you've got something which is living in, in the heart of that Kivir diagram. That is the worst performing system. The best performing system will hug the perimeter because it's always going to come out with a factor of one. And you'll see that it's on this 128 cores. There's not a huge amount in it. But actually, with the exception of the VASP case and the CASTEP case, then Sapphire Rapids clearly is the most performance system. There are examples here when you compare the Milan 7573X to the Ice Lake systems in particular, that actually it is outperforming the, those systems. 256 cores, similar conclusion, right? But if you look at the perimeter of that Kivir diagram, then in most cases, with the exception of CASTEP, and we've tried to rationalize that because of MPI all to all B, then again, Sapphire Rapids is actually the most performance system. Now go to node to node, and I hope I've convinced you that when you do that, then Sapphire Rapid node performance is significantly better. Well, there's no surprise there. It should be, right? But when you actually look at the corresponding Kivir diagram, then it's really obvious. So there you have Sapphire Rapids, with the exception of Casca down there on the left-hand quadrant, is way ahead of everything else. Um, and not surprisingly, you have Sky Lake and actually Cascade Lake in the middle of that. Then beyond it, you have AMD Rome that has 64 processors per core. 
compared to the 40 processors per core, sorry, per node in Skylake. And you've got most of the Ice Lake systems being pretty close, but clearly uh, Sapphire Rapid is, is outperforming those by stretch. And the same sort of thing on four node, but when you get to four node, this CASTEP situation is even more marked. So for every other application you find in Sapphire Rapids is hugging a perimeter, it does not do that when you actually get to CASTEP. Uh, so the summary really core to core suggests on average of the Intel SPR, Sapphire Rapids is outperforms all other Intel SKUs with the exception of CASTEP. And you can draw various other conclusions based on those performance charts in terms of where Milan will sit compared to particularly Ice Lake and also the Sapphire Rapids based on the level of AVX 512 usage. Um, you can do a similar comparison node to node, node to node, then Sapphire Rapids is, has far superior performance, again, with the exception of Castet. But Genoa should be the example one is contrasting with Sapphire Rapids, actually, and not Milan. So hopefully, when we get access to be able to do that. A uh, bunch of acknowledgements here, actually, the people who've helped um, in terms of, in particular, getting access to these systems. Um, the bottom bullet there is actually help that I got from. I was helping in the procurement from the guys down at Plymouth Marine Lab for discussions on Nemo and FECOM. And they were really hard codes to build, actually. Um, and I guess that's it, I think. So quick summary there, which effectively reflects the choice of applications, reflects the choice of systems that we've actually looked at. The point about processing elements, i.e. cores and nodes is important. You will get, if you have a genuinely have a processing um, comparison on, on, a, on a fat node, which is outperforming all the other cores um, from other suppliers, then that, that would be the system, I think, of choice. And again, the genuinely miserable bottom line is I can't say anything about pricing, which actually at the end of the day drives the bus, right? Um, Anyway, so thank you. And I hope some of that at least you found interesting. Thanks very much. Questions? Uh, the man with the hand again. Yes. Hold on. Well, let's use this one for the remote people. It should work. And Simon will check if that's OK. So the one thing I'm missing which is on this slide, but not in the benchmarks you showed us, is the 9480. Because all the codes right. are memory bound, so I would assume that the HPM would make a significant difference. Where, where does the 9480 lie? Well, OK. So let me try to answer it and fail. So the, the 9480 is only going to help on memory bandwidth codes. It's not going to help on memory latency. It's not going to do anything to that. All of the molecular simulation codes, so this is partly getting out of jail, all of the molecular simulation codes are dominated by memory latency, not by memory bandwidth. Those performance reports where you're seeing 70% memory doesn't say anything whether it's bandwidth or latency. Okay, has that satisfied you? Yeah. Thank you. Really? Okay. Um, <laughs> let, let, me, let me argue against myself. <laughs> The one code in there, actually, and I don't have an answer for it because it's too hard to build to help with a whiny excuse, um, is Nemo. I don't think any of the other codes actually are truly memory bandwidth crippled at all. The one which is, is Nemo, and I've not managed as yet to build it. So all of those applications that I ran on the 9480 are not. Remember the 9480 has a slower clock speed. Mm -hmm. Right, so you're comparing two gig against 1.9, and that actually is quite a lot. So the glory days of three gigahertz processors and DL Poly doing really well to ramp up the clock speed, boom, they, they're gone. Right, you've got these miserly bloody clock speeds, and you've got hundreds of cores that you've got to somehow try and ramp up. So that difference of point one of the gigahertz actually on the 8480 and the 9480. Is quite a lot. I need to run Nemo on it. 
it has no effect on Nemo, then I, I really don't know what is going on because I have run stream, I didn't put on there, and that is a terabyte a second on the 9480, which is really scary. Anyway. Did you have your hand up? Uh, okay. would, oh, yeah, I'm just asking somebody uh, to unmute online, hopefully, yeah. Hi, uh, hi, Martin. Thanks for the presentation. It's your just one moment. We just need to sort out the sound here. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. I can hear you whispering. Ah, you mean, okay, they, they want to ask the question themselves. Yeah. Hi, is it fine now? Hang on a sec. We're almost with you. Yep. Hang on there. We're almost with you. No, Hang on, we're not almost with you. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, Simon, Simon, Simon will repeat the question. Hi, uh, oh, okay. Sound final? Yeah. This is a great way of getting out of answering tricky questions, all right? <laughs> Let's remember this. Um, sorry, at the moment, we don't have sound from you in the room, so can you ask the quest question and I'll repeat. Um, yeah, uh, so Martin went on for uh, <clears throat> that the Intel compilers are not so great. Uh, if, if you try alternative compilers on AMD hardware and uh, what is the Intel still the best, or can you help it by using an alternative compiler suite to a uh... question? To be honest, yes, I have. Were they any better? They didn't show the same problems, but the performance was always worse, right? And I think genuinely there are two factors. The in, it's not the Intel compiler, it's the MKL library. So you really see it on code such as VASP where you have a significant vector contribution. And MKL certainly does not recognize AVX instructions beyond a certain date. And so I think why the whole problem that I ran into um, with, which was MPI specific, when I moved MPI versions, I found the performance getting worse. I don't understand that. I mean, I have to be honest. And I've not made any concerted effort to switch and to interrogate properly the variety of other compilers which I know are out there. My, my attempts have been limited to GNU, and I know that's always going to be worse. I mean, it played catch up for a long time, and with that playing catch up and regular optimization issues and errors when trying to generate code. But no, I've not done a proper job on that. I will be the first to admit it. But if you say it is MKL, you should be able to hear the remote people now. So, does that answer the question? Uh, Whoa, <laughs> I hope it did. <laughs> if I just can follow on of, of what Martin said, so if the issue is not the compiler, if it's the MKL, which part are you using, the BLAS or the FFTW, uh, the FFT part of MKL? And if so, uh, switching in a different BLAS library uh, yeah, or the point. T, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's, oh my goodness. I'm pretty sure it's MKL, which is the source of one of the problems. So I'm certain that it does not recognize AVX instructions beyond 2019-5, and therefore you're going to see a performance hit, right? I don't believe it's the compiler, but the second problem, which is why do I have numerous issues when using the later versions of MPI with Parallel Studio, which, by the way, go away with one API. So one API saved my bacon, actually, ahead of the previous 
computing insight because I'd literally spend a month training miserably to get any continuity between those different compiler releases. And I switched to one API and almost as if by magic, right, everything worked. I'm not, that, that doesn't say anything about performance, but it removed that catalog of woes in terms of you know, execution violation, exceptions here, there, and everywhere, everything hanging. And when I sought advice, and I don't know who's online, so again, a pretty dodgy statement to make, but when I sought advice, and this was on the Dell Benchmarking Center, um, as to how can somebody help, because I'm just stuck. They said, yeah, the advice we would give you is do not use Intel software on AMD processors. Great. Well, that wasn't really an option, but it may go back to the original question. You have to use different compilers, as indeed Archer obviously do. Um, so three possible sources. I don't really understand the problem. I know there are at least two problems that are real. Do I have an answer to them? No. So, uh, and I'm also really mindful of the fact that my presentations always come over as Intel bias and they're really not meant to be. Right? It's just the experience I find when I try to use Intel software on AMD processors is pretty nasty. And I would kind of worry that when I do get access to Genova, if I follow this same path, I'm going to see exactly the same thing again. Yeah, exactly. It might be worse even because then you have AVX 5 yeah, turns yes. to a new set of uh, yeah. workarounds that you will need. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll be gone by then. <laughs> Somebody else's problem. Uh, then maybe I can add a question right Please. away. So any plans to try this work also on Archer and probably on Lumi because there's a nice difference between Archer and Lumi and I think it's Rome and Milan and there is one and two network adapters per, uh, per socket. Or yeah, is it just the fact that we don't have Intel that's stopping you from trying that? Well, no, that's not the reason. I mean, I think I did go and use a 7742, right? But I did that on a system within Atos because at that point, Archer 2 was really flaky. It was in the very early days. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to muck around with that. I mean, it's bad enough trying to sort this bloody problem out on the Dell systems. I don't want another set of corresponding problems to sort out. But you're completely right. The only way that I can really sort this out is just to walk away from using Intel and have a separate thread which actually says no Intel. I, I say I'm not biased towards Intel. I'm not. It's not that easy as it seems, though, because some of those applications have trouble on many other compilers. Yeah, sure. But Basically, actually, Intel copied some of, especially if it's a Fortran application like VASP, Intel copied some of the bugs from GNU Fortran. Yeah. So some of those codes only work well on GNU Fortran and Intel Fortran. And we all know that GNU Fortran is not that good. Indeed. Um, I do think actually genuinely, and if people want to argue the toss against this, that's fine. I do think Intel did the community a huge favor for a long time. I mean, you had to pay for the honor right but but their software for a decade or longer you know i think was first class i mean the last four or five years i think it's been awful right but there was certainly a period um and it, it was exemplified when when i went to cardiff in 2007 it was an opter on amd shop and then amd self-destructed for a decade in rather spectacular fashion. And the evolution of Intel processors together with the evolution of their software actually meant that I think the, the environment was stable and you did see improvements that were reasonable moving from processor generation to processor generation. Um, but it's tricky, right? Because you can make a pretty valid argument which says we shouldn't do any of this stuff at all you should just be using GPUs. Why are you mucking around with all this stuff? Um, the cost of developing and rewriting a software package to exploit GPUs efficiently is arguably over a period of time 
more than the hardware that you're actually going to run it on. So I look at the, the, the finances involved in the evolution of NW Chem, and I, I led that group over there for a while. I mean, it's huge. But anyway, we're getting way off track with that particular bloody line. But... Um, I just put up on the screen here and shared onto Zoom is Andy Turner had pointed the latest uh, Archer 2 statistics on software use, which is still vast bleeding. Yeah. Um, that's for last month. If you scroll further down this page, um, link is in both the Zoom chat and on oh, Slack, okay. then um, it has information, uh, historical information, that's the word I'm looking for. Yes, yeah, so actually, I should have used Gromax for this presentation, actually, and not Amber, because Gromax certainly is... Hey, well, it doesn't suffer from memory latency in the same way that the other molecular dynamics do. Uh, sorry, question? Yeah, um, I just have one uh, little remark also. Um, just uh, thank you also because uh, your presentation that I saw a couple of years ago was very helpful for us to sort of explore the landscape when it was time for us to buy a new cluster and we have to choose between Good. AMD and Intel. So just thank you for your work. Sure. Really useful. Uh, secondly, I, I find it useful when you do the stream benchmarks just for information is that they have this performance pattern where you sort of hit a brick wall when you use like a quarter of the cores, sometimes on the ROM chip, you hit the maximum bandwidth already. Yes. So you have like a 30 core chips, uh, which is essentially from memory bandwidth an eight core chip because the other you can just disable and won't do anything when you um, bandwidth limit. True. So I would find it useful to have like just a table saying, when is when do you hit the brick wall? Yeah, because it's a useful piece. I used to do that actually, yeah, and I stopped okay. kind of doing it. But okay, that's a good feedback. I'll try and build those into it. No, but I... oh, okay. Uh, the last one, do you see any benefit from hyper-threading? Um, historically, I've never pursued that seriously because most HPC codes do not benefit from it. And maybe my vision on it is blurred. Um, with DL Poly, I've tried hyper-threading. It, it just got worse and nothing improved. Um, but it, it's quite hard. Actually, I, I don't know a bandwidth, I'm sure, oh, sorry, I don't know a benchmark, I'm sure there is one for memory latency, right? I mean, stream is just the popular, but that's just memory bandwidth. And there is a memory latency one, and I need to get on top of that. But the answer is no, but have I, have I tested rigorously for it and tried to improve code? No, mm -hmm. I have. I mean, they're not, if they were open MP, enabled codes, then probably one would potentially see a lot more benefit, um, but DL Poly is not, for example. Thank you. Okay. Any other burning questions in the room? If not, I, I have a final one. Um, so how much, how much effort, effort is it to, to go across all these systems to get all these things to work to the point where you're confident that you're doing a proper job, right? Because it's not that easy to go into a new system, get some kind of performance, and then know that that's what you're supposed to be getting if you're doing a proper job. Right. Um, well, there's ways you can approach it, which means it's likely to minimize that time. And you need to choose an application that you know, right? So, and I think it's a counter argument, but I won't make it. Um, so I always start with the Apollo because I know it. And if I see anything when I'm doing that first step, so either DL Poly or the synthetics, right? So I picked up that all to all the problem really early on with Sapphire Graphics. Um, DL Poly, if, if that doesn't work, nothing's gonna work. It's as simple as that. So I think you can take steps which minimize the amount of time involved. And you get to a point which sounds very subjective and 
hardly quantitative where you actually think i know this system now it doesn't have any surprises for me you can rattle through six or seven applications like that in the time it takes to do the first one um, so i think there is a level of confidence and i wouldn't put <laughs> famous last words i wouldn't put numbers up if i thought they were dodgy or there were question marks around them and the most depressing thing is when you suddenly have been through all of that and you suddenly there's a a loud noise which actually says but what about that and, you say, oh, yes. and then you have to go back and do it again um so i i'm fairly confident in the numbers i put up i've never a famous last word i've never had anybody turn around and say that's absolute crap because of this right and in fact it actually will be a good thing probably if when somebody does that but i'm blissfully aware that if i did the job properly i can't do that job properly i need to be looking at other compilers i need to be doing a much more rigorous check you can minimize that to some extent by using community codes right because they're called that because there has been a, a community effort to get them to the stage that they're at so they should be fairly well optimized by the time you get to them and it always kind of surprises me when i find something and it surprises the authors of the code as well actually um, when you say to them do you know how bad this is and they say oh shit, no so the deal poly was a good example of that where i don't think they've recognized the complete failure to exploit avx instructions stuff like that you can pick up fairly quickly and fairly routinely okay and it does scare me uh, because you've been doing this for 30 years you have a lot of experience in getting close to run across a variety of systems the flip side of that there's people there's new people starting now researchers who are getting on the biggest machines in the world and they have basically zero experience in yeah. going from one system to another um, so there's there's lots of time that, get, that gets lost because people don't have the necessary experience or the, the right approach to this and it's, uh, yeah that's true Actually, that is definitely true. If I look at the average user on oh, 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 Cardiff, right, they pick up somebody else's script, they run community codes, they will not recognize that actually, ooh, cake points, what are they, right? And they'll be running at, and when you look at the efficiency, so we monitor the efficiency of every job which is run, and the number of them, which are like 5% or even less, right and then you have to go to that user and try and rationalize why that is and then they get pissed because you know why are you telling me how to run my jobs that bloody barrier that you have to navigate mm -hmm. um, it is quite hard and I actually it's getting worse not better smartphones i yeah. blame it on smartphones indeed people are just flipping around they have no <laughs> idea how it works yeah so yeah yeah, there's another two questions from Andy. Yeah. Who? Um, yeah. So, have you tried making the benchmarks using EasyBuild or SPAC to improve things? So, building the software using tools like EasyBuild or SPAC? No, I haven't, and I should have done. That's why I'm here. Bit late. Bit late, never. A bit late. No, I haven't. And it's a classic thing, right? You, you, you start off doing it as a, as a kind of pastime and you build up tar balls from here, there and body everywhere. Um, you don't keep them properly. So, I mean, I was the lead author of Games UK. I do that properly, but I don't do this properly because this is, this is part, a pastime. I, this is, know what I'm meant to be doing. I end up doing it because nobody else would probably do it, right? But it's it's not my job. I guess you have experience enough in building these codes that you don't need tools like EasyBuild or SPAC to, to help you out. That's kind of true, but the problem is these are community codes which are well documented and everything else, right? So they are not a problem. If you try to take this experience and take it into AI and machine learning, right, that's a totally different ballgame. 
And I've tried to get some of the other staff at Cardiff to do that. And I mean, an absolute pig's ear of it, to be honest. They, they've just not progressed it. So I'm operating in quite a narrow space. And if I really wanted to move out beyond material simulation and Games UK, I would have to change the way I do it. You're right. There's another question by Andy as well. Yeah, you should scroll up a bit. Um, yeah, and then a similar question, I guess, how about using Reframe to automate the running and the capturing of the performance data? So Reframe is a, is a tool for testing HPC software, essentially. Yeah, could do. Um, the trouble is, he said, trying to come up with an excuse, that the, <laughs> the trouble is this access tends to come and go very quickly, right? And if I had everything automated and everything set up that I could just move it around from system to system, then sure, that would be great. But literally, historically, at least, one will get access to a system for 24 hours, 48 hours, and then, you, then you're off. And so, you know, trying to get the maximum out of it in that period of time, other than working 23 hours a day, uh, was kind of tricky. Okay. One more question? Yeah, Sam, let's go for it. We should move up a bit. So I'm going to ask a quite ignorant question. So Great, I love them once. <laughs> I was always uh, thinking that the problem with the memory, that's the memory bandwidth, and I never heard about memory latency, especially for FASP. I was told that memory bandwidth was the most important problem for VASP. Yeah, sorry, memory latency are on the molecular dynamics codes. Molecular dynamics codes typically are sampling across a very wide, broad space. You can optimize that process, but molecular dynamics is a, is a class of code which really suffer from latency. VASP doesn't. Yeah, VASP is memory bandwidth. Okay, thanks. And it's also very much a function of the size of the case and the example. That's the other problem with this. It's very easy to say I benchmark games UK or I benchmark this, but it's really a function of the data sets. And you can be running, and I didn't really show you there, VASP on two different data sets. And the conclusions you come to are quite different. Community codes capture a multitude of sins. They're million line codes often with so much functionality so you'll see people giving you an argument which says that NW Chem, for example, is really good at using GPUs. And the reason why it's really good at using GPUs is you use a tiny fraction of the functionality, couple cluster, triples, which is totally dominated by matrix multiplications, which run like off a shovel, you know, on um on GPUs, but that doesn't say anything about 99% of what the code is actually doing most of the time. Sorry, that's a bit off path. Okay, thanks. Okay.